someone say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord can someone just say thank you Jesus praise the Lord well today I want to speak with us for a few moments from the scripture that was read and I want to focus on verse 19. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and the verse 19. And I want to speak with us on the theme quenching the spirit. Yes. Quenching the spirit. That's our focus today. And uh, yes, from I was a boy in the church, I've been hearing that do not quench 
the Spirit. So, today, we look at verse 19. Four words in verse 19. Quench not the Spirit. Just like that. Quench not the Spirit. Well, I looked at the word for quench in the Greek. Not the easiest word to pronounce if you're reading from the Greek text. It's the word... They knew me. And it is in the imperative mood, which means that it is not just a simple statement or a simple sentence, but a rule. It is not a suggestion. It's a commission. It is not a byword. It is a command from the apostle. Quench not the spirit. But what did this mean for the church at Thessalonica and what does it mean for us today quench not the spirit well looking at the Greek word looking at this imperative benyumi it's benyumi actually means to put out or to extinguish. So today, we would use the word extinguish to put out a fire. It is not, uh, this is the word actually that the Greek would use for quench. Well, it says in the Greek, spenumi, which means for us to quench, but it's actually to extinguish, to put out. You want to put out a fire, you run for your extinguisher. Isn't that so? Well, the apostle is saying, do not spray your extinguisher on the spirit. Don't make the spirit feel quenched or chilled. If I try to understand it. So as I was saying, it's a command. Bless the Lord. It's indeed a command. And brothers and sisters today, I want to say that there are things that, well, listen this. Normally, they say if you are in church, if you are in church and service is going on, and the Spirit of God is coming down upon you, or you feel the Spirit of God, you must not try to quench it. You must not try to disregard the Spirit. You would want the Spirit to use you to do anything that He wants to do. So if the Spirit says to you, run around this building, 
you want to run around the building. If the spirit says roll on the floor, you would want to roll on the floor. We have a lot of calling out in church today. Um, come out here, sister, and come out here, brother. Why? The spirit tells me to call you. And if you don't do it, then you are quenching the spirit. Well, fine, I accept. Because the spirit must feel quench if he tells you to do something and you refuse to do it. Or if the spirit is working upon your body and you want to become stiff upon the spirit. But I want to say to us that there is more than one way in which we can quench the spirit. And today, if we look very closely, brothers and sisters, at the epistle that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, we can see a few things that have the ability to quench the spirit. So, is a number of impacts that he gave to us. The same thing that he gave to the church at Thessalonica, he gives to us today in the word of God. So in the course of these imperatives that Paul commands us not to quench the spirit, is like the, the advice about the quenching comes in the middle. So he's giving us these imperatives, and within the course of the imperatives, he says, quench not the spirit, which means that any one of these imperatives that are disregarded will quench the spirit. So the things that he instructs us against are the very things that can let the spirit be quenched. So look at what he says. If we back up a little bit to one of the imperatives, let's start from verse 16. He says, rejoice evermore. And believe it or not, rejoice is a command in the Greek tense. It's an imperative. Uh, just like you do uh, Spanish or French. They have moods. Right? And uh, yes, if you go in the imperative mood, then that's the command. So rejoice here is an imperative. So he says, rejoice evermore. Why should you rejoice evermore? Rejoice always and continue to rejoice. I'm going to tell you exactly why. If you don't rejoice evermore, that can quench the spirit. As simple as it looks, it can quench the spirit. Just bear with me a few today and I'll show you. Praise the Lord. An unhappy look in worship can turn off worshipers. Yes. If someone mounts the pulpit to do something, and when the person goes up there, all the person can see is faces that look downhearted. The first thing the person is going to think, oh, apparently they don't want me up here. And what does that do? That quenches the spirit. That in and of itself is a quencher. So it's not only when a person feels the spirit coming down on them. And you say, boy, no, I don't want the spirit to work on me right now. I'm going to quench the spirit. That is not the only quenching of the spirit. There are other things that quench the spirit. And that is why Paul gives the advisory. Yes. So, well, Apostle, maybe. But he says, rejoice evermore. You can imagine you left your house coming to church, Evangelist Henry, and on the way you're singing a song. So before, before you reach church, 
your soul is already blessed. But by the time you reach church, the first person you run into, you say, uh, good morning, my sister, or praise Jesus, my brother. Turn around. Morning. No, the morning won't tell you. Spoil your morning. You don't even feel like you want to stay at church. It's a turn off altogether. What does that do? That is a quencher. Spirit can't, the spirit cannot feel good. Deacon. With that kind of attitude. Praise the Lord. So, if the person comes to church and the first person she sees or the first person he sees, I said, praise Jesus, my brother. I said, hallelujah, sister. You know that both of you are ready to worship because he says we are two or three are gathered touching anything concerning my name. I'm going to be in the midst to bless and to do good. Amen. So you must rejoice evermore. Have a rejoicing spirit. You know the child of God who is really rejoicing evermore? You don't know when he has problem from when he doesn't. Because every time you ask him, how are you? He said, I'm fine, man. I'm fine. Even though he just experienced some challenges, he said, I'm fine. So you can never know if he's not fine because he's fine all the time. And some of us are so accustomed to smiling that even we have the greatest of problems in our lives, we are still smiling. Rejoice evermore. Don't let your countenance turn off anyone. Praise the Lord. You know, every relationship, I realize, needs rejoicing. Happiness is the life of a relationship. So if you're going to have a relationship with your brothers and sisters, you have to rejoice. In wives, if you are here and you never know, let me tell you. When your husband comes home, do you know the first place he looks? We have someone who really loves food, so they find it. But the average man is going to look in the face of his wife. Are you happy? Or not? Oh, you don't hear me. Yes. The first place he's going to look, he's going to look in the face of his wife to see if she is happy. He wants her to be happy. Because if the wife is happy, chances are he will be happy. When you see a man turns up to work, he's bouncing and he's happy. He goes to work and he's unhappy. And the first person that comes across him or double cross him anyway, he just look at the person and say, you're fired. Go home. And you say, hold on the boss, just, just, just hear me out and let me explain. And he says, go home, go home, man. Don't want to hear anything from you. And he's so angry. You know why he's angry? He's not a rejoicing worker. Hmm. If you trace that, if you trace that kind of attitude at work, and you can trace it back home, apostle, you will realize that there's a, there's a deeper problem for that anger and for that long face and big up spirit. Wife lack shop on him. That is why that has to be taken out on someone out there. And even when he comes home and the dog runs to meet him because the dog is so happy to see him. So the dog sort of does Start up on him through back foot and, you know, using two front foot, touching toes. And give the dog one kick up to the devil feeling, man. 
You know why? He's, un he's a very unhappy man. But if you can make that man rejoice, the whole family is happy. So you might look at this instruction and say, okay, rejoice evermore, that can stay. No, it is a very, very important ingredient. And if the worship service is to go on and go on the right way, brethren must be rejoicing. Amen? Now, we can have challenges with each other. And we can have problems with each other because in every relationship, whether it is wife or husband or brother or sister, whatever it is, problems are going to arise. But the problem is not the problem. The problem is how you deal with the problem. Suppose you want the problem to stay forever. Hmm? Suppose you want the problem to stay forever. It's going to stay forever. But you put the problem aside and you rejoice in the Lord. So rejoicing is part of the thing. Bless the Lord. And once you rejoice, you make others rejoice. Is that amen? You ever hear the saying, smile and the world smiles back at you? Yes. But if you huff and puff, it's like you huff and puff at the world. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You know, one day, a husband thought that, how do I solve my problem at home? I am always unhappy. I'm always unhappy with my wife. So how am I going to solve this problem? Because every time that he comes home from work, he wants to have some kind of time with his wife. His wife says she has a headache. Yes, every time is a headache. So once it's a headache, you have to go about your business. So one day, on the way from work, the man stopped at the shop and he buy two fensic. As he reached home, he handed his wife the fensic. And his wife said, what is that for? He says, for your headache. And his wife said, I don't have a headache. But the wife would know why he laughed. Because he expected a headache. Today is good news. When I carry home the fensic, she doesn't have a headache. But that's it. The entire home is happy when one man is happy. The same thing is in, is in the church, you know. If you are happy, I am happy. If you are not happy, I'm going to wonder, why are you not happy? So, not rejoicing is a quencher. In case you never know, if you're not a rejoicing brother or a rejoicing sister, it serves as a quencher. Praise the Lord. And that is why he gave these instructions. Here's another instruction. This one comes in verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. If you don't pray without ceasing, it could be a quencher. Why? Because when you don't pray, you play. This, the, the, the devil gets away with you if you don't pray. So by not praying, the spirit can be quenched so easily. And we have a lot of persons who will go to church, but the part of the service they love is the part where you where you are actually dancing. Yes, play the drum. They like to hear the drum and you roll the drum and they get to dance and so on. And, but guess what? If you say, Thursday night is prayer meeting, only three persons are going to come out. So what do you think that is going to be now? A quencher. And the, other, the few that are there 
don't, they're, not, not, they're not even in the mood to pray. Why? Because some persons don't like to pray. Some persons don't want to continue praying. And therefore that provides a quencher. So pray without ceasing. Don't cease to pray. As a matter of fact, you know, Jesus says it and sums it up right in Luke chapter 18. He says, this is how you pray. You have to pray with determination. He gave the story of this woman who went to the unjust judge. And Monday, she would say, judge, I want you to avenge me because this is what is happening to me. My enemy is doing this to me. And the judge said, lady, get lost. Just, just move from my doorway. Um, or, or, or get away from my office. But you know what? To his surprise, to his surprise, Tuesday, she was back. I said, lady, were you not the same person I drove away from my office yesterday? And then she left. But Wednesday morning, she was back. She's asking without ceasing. So it didn't take the judge. The judge wasn't that done. She didn't take him long to realize that this woman is never going to stop praying or asking until she gets what she desires. So that's what he said to himself. If I don't let this woman get justice, she is going to weary me. Amen? Amen? Amen, somebody. Bless the Lord. Just some technical. So, sometimes when the Spirit is about to deliver you, that's when you stop praying and that is going to provide a quencher. So you need to pray. If you don't want to pray, that's a quencher. And when you begin to pray, pray until you get the answer. Psalm 123 says, As the dogs look into the hands of their masters, so, Lord, we look to you, not until we become tired and weak and discouraged, but until you come and have mercy upon us. Because sometimes you, you ever hear one ring, and just as you take up the phone to answer, that's when the person hangs up. So sometimes just as the Spirit of God is going to do his work, that's when we give in. That's when we quit and move on to something else. Now that is a quencher. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Look at verse 18. And you wonder why Paul used quench not the spirit in these instructions. Why did he sandwich quench not the spirit in all of these instructions? Because these instructions without them or omitting them would be a quencher verse 18 in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you bless the lord bless the lord you ever hear the term ungratefulness is next to witchcraft you cannot be ungrateful and some of us are not only ungrateful to man we are ungrateful to God so he said in everything give thanks bless the Lord bless the Lord you know sometimes people go to church but they are still vexed. They are still upset. They carry a long face. 
And if you should talk to them, they give you a whole long line of complaints. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know that you have problems. Yes, I know you have challenges in your life. Everybody does. My trial doesn't come the way yours come. But you know what? I'm going to tell us something today. When there are problems in your life, how about giving God thanks for what he has already done for you and the rest you hope he will come to? How about that? He brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, if, he, if God brought you here, do, do you not think that the God who took you from Egypt and brought you now to Mount Horem is able to take you from here to the next point? No, you are grumbling and complaining. Why did Moses take us out of Egypt? Although we were slaves in Egypt, we were better off. Mm -mm. That's the spirit of ungratefulness. When God is doing something for you, work with God. Give him thanks for what he has already done. He may not do everything, but what happened? When the people began to murmur and to grumble and complain, what happened? God made snakes to come out of the ground and bite them and they start to become sick. Yes, because God does not appreciate the spirit of ungratefulness. Yes, I know that we have challenges, but how about thanking God for bringing you thus far? When you really think of it, you know, if we should count our blessing. The next time you need to pray, start by counting your blessing. Start by saying, Lord, I thank you for waking me up this morning and setting me on my way. You didn't have to do it, but you did. And then you begin to recall the blessings. You realize that once you begin to recall the blessings, you start to forget about the few problems because the amount of blessings that the Lord gave you outweigh and outnumber the few problems in your life so thank him for what he has already done and stop the complaining every day God why me why me did you know that other people grudge you other people grudge you for your position other people grudge you for where you are yet you open your mouth and ask him every day God why me okay why not you how about God? Thank you. Hear what the writer says. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Yes, I know that you're going to have challenges in your life. But once you begin to count those blessings and you thank God for what he has already done in your life, God will come to your rescue and fix the current problems that you have. Is that amen? Amen. Yes, man. So when you grumble and complain and everything is going wrong and you're telling God, God, my life upside down and I am not happy and you can't carry around a smiling face because everything is going wrong. You'd be surprised. Everything is not going wrong. You just need to give God thanks. For those things that went right and those things that are going wrong they will automatically be fixed so in everything give thanks bless the lord for this is the will of god concerning you you know what they say your disappointment can be god's appointment Yes, your disappointment can be God's appointment. Why? Because some of the things that you ask God for, the car that you ask God for, if God had given you the car when you asked for it, if he didn't disappoint you, 
Did you know that a truck, the devil had a truck ready to write you off with the car? But God, God did not answer that prayer because he wanted the car to wait. Come on, somebody. So God's appointment may turn out to be your disappointment. And that is why you should give God thanks not to give you the car because you don't know what was awaiting you. This is the will of God concerning you. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's just like some persons, they're going to get married, and the mother said, you know, I don't like the man you're going to get married to. He doesn't look like the person that we love you and take care of you. And you say, Mom, you know, that is the man I love and that's the man I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. Okay. So you talk to pastor. And pastor says, well, let me talk to the Lord about this relationship. And the Lord will show me whether this man is good for you or whether this is going to be a, a good union. Mm-hmm. And pastor comes back to you and he says, you know, the word that the Lord gives me is unequal yoke. That means if you get married to this man, it's not going to work out. It's going to be unequal yoked. And you say, no, no, that is going to disappoint me. This is the man I love. I'm going to get married to him. Well, I'll tell you what. One way or another, that man is going to kill you. If he doesn't kill you with a gun, he's going to kill you with stress. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. You didn't hear me. So it's better to be disappointed and say, God, thank you because I heard from you. Because this is the will of God concerning you. And don't grumble and complain. Because if you grumble and complain, the Lord may well turn his back. And when you grumble and complain, that is a quencher of the spirit. You quench the spirit when you complain. When you walk in your house, God expects you to say, Thank you, Jesus, for journeying mercy. But as you reach home, you start to see the problems again. And you say, God, why me? God, what have I done to you? That is a quencher. So you realize it's not only in church that you can create the spirit. You can create the spirit at home. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. You don't even know that I'm preaching a good message. Huh? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hear what verse 3, 29 says. 21. 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 and 21. Hear what verse 21 says. Verse 21 says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. And I think this part is a problem. Uh, that, that word, Prove there means try. Try all things. Make sure it is provable. Bless the Lord. Because some Christians love to run away with the first false news. And sometimes it not quite goes so, you know. Sometimes it very, very near goes so. Are you with me, church? Hmm? All right. Just hold a moment and I'll tell you a story. Short story, though. Pastor was home one day with his wife. And he wasn't paying attention to her at the time. So she was in the house. And she saw this lizard. And so she was very, very scared when he came to creeping things and 
she started to scream in the house, calling her husband to come. Her husband is a pastor. Calling him to come. Come, come. It's like it was dead, man. It's like judgment, the noise and the scream. When the husband went, what do you think it was? The lizard. So, he, he looks around what he could use because he just wanted to get rid of the lizard just, just to make her calm down. So he looks in one of the corners and he saw a broom. He went for the broom to kill the lizard. By the time, you know, he makes the first strike after the lizard, the lizard makes one jump. Looks like all the thing jump into, the, into his wife's direction. Hey, she ran outside with the screaming. And the husband now will run behind her with the broom in her hand and say, come back inside. In no time the news spread over the community. Oh, pastor, up there again, wife, one piece of beaten with, with, with one broom. She gets some lick out of the broomstick so that she has to run out the door. And he, when she run out, even when she run out the door, he run behind her and tell her, said, come back inside. No, wasn't that true? Of course. But, and I saw the story go, not, not quite true. So, guess what? Before you run away with the story, the Bible says, prove all things. Look here, let me tell you something now. You know, brothers and sisters, I don't care what office you have. If you go by the Bible, you cannot be wrong. If you don't prove things, you are going to quench the spirit. Because something sounds so true and so good. But guess what? It's not quite so. So it says, prove not some things, not most things, but prove all things. Praise the Lord. Even if you're going to preach a sermon, don't preach it if you don't sure say so it go. Because someone is going to meet you in the vestry and say, look here. Why do you think that this is so? So if you're not sure Jesus is coming back, don't preach it and tell people. Make sure you can go to another scripture and say, this is the evidence for it. Evidential truth. That is the truth we want to put forward. Yes, propositional truth can work. But in some cases where evidence is necessary, the preacher needs to point out why this is so and why it cannot be otherwise. Prove all things. Amen. This is instruction for the church of God. And we must hold fast that which is good. And if you don't prove all things, you know, guess what? That can be a quencher, evangelist, for the spirit. Praise the Lord. Amen. Don't sign up. Of course, they are tried and proven. You know, when you're a person who, 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 who proves all things, not everyone is going to run to you to tell you what they hear. Did you know that? They be, they, people start knowing you by heart. Not everyone is going to run to you and tell you what they hear. They start knowing you by heart. Because the first question that you are going to ask is, how you know? Are we still here, somebody? How you know? How do you know? If you run away with everything that you hear, how are you going to know? Look here. Somebody says that God made us with two ears and one mouth. So we should listen twice than we talk. Hmm? Twice. We should listen twice the amount of times than we talk. Prove all things. 
Just don't sign off on the first thing you hear. As a matter of fact, believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. And the person who brings the news to, the burden of proof is on that person's shoulder to prove the case. Are we still here? No, the, I'm not, I didn't get this document from Mandeville Courthouse or from the Justice of the Peace. This is not your protocol. This is the biblical protocol we're talking about now. It is the Bible that instructs us that we must prove all things. Yes. What should you do? Prove all things. You know how some wife and husband mash up? Because somebody says, when you go on to work, your wife your wife, young man, as you turn out, him turn in. Yes, it's a lot of abuse. Some wives get, you know, for jealousy. But did you prove it? Yes. Your friend tell you that you get in the bun, but did you prove the bun? It may not be true. So you need to prove it. I guess one woman was trying to prove her case when she was driving. Both wife and husband had cars. So she was driving on the road. And she, a car, she saw her husband's car turn in a particular road. And she said, then, where is he going? So she decides, say, okay, she will have to prove the case today. So she turned around and, and, and went up in the road right behind him. And the man, you, 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 know where, you know where the car ended up? In another parish. And she stopped a little away from the vehicle and said, let me watch which one of the houses in going. You know, so when the man come out, though, he's not a husband, though. The car looks like he's, the car had dead his car. But no. Not him at all. Not him at all. So it is in the same way, if someone came to her and said, I saw your husband gone to another woman's house. He come home, come beat her up. It's not him. The man was at work, working hard to feed his family. Prove all things. Once you go by the Bible, you cannot be wrong. You must have a good relationship, whether at church, school, at work, or play, or at home. Praise the Lord. Bless the Lord. Another, another one stopped at a particular yard. And when she saw the car park up, Mm. She come out and say, all right, when him come out of that house, he will see. He will see. So she never make fun to mash up the car. And her husband car. The man just, the man who come out for car, when he come out, he might wonder, who could have mash up in vehicle? Prove all things. Amen. Amen. I mean, some persons enjoy carrying news. You find a lot of journalists sometimes in the church. They like to carry the news, especially the news, juicy. But prove it. Once you prove it, you probably can take it from there and deal with it. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. All of these are imperatives. Look at the following verse. I want us to see the following verse. Praise the Lord. Look at the following verse. The following verse is the verse 22. Bless the Lord. Hear what it says. 
abstain from all appearance of evil. Of what? What does that word mean, appearance of evil? Appearance means that it looks like. You hear what the old lady used to say? If it, if it smells like a rat, and if it looks like a rat, then it's a rat. There's a rat somewhere. Praise the Lord. So ab abstain from all appearance of evil. Once it looks like evil, stay away from it. So it's not evil, you know. Don't get me wrong now. Don't, don't run away with this. It only appears like it's evil, but it's not evil. It only looks that way. The Bible says you must stay away from it. Bless the Lord. And, and, and he knows why. He knows why you must stay away from the very appearance of evil. We, we have persons who think they are strong Christians and we want to prove themselves as strong. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I have a friend. This is your testimony. I have a friend and he's passing through and his car breaks down, so he says he can't go home. He will have to stay with me for the night. Does it look like evil, evil for him to stay with you? Of course it looks like evil. Because the next thing you know, very early in the morning, he leaves, he comes out of the house to go look about the car, and somebody sees him coming out of the house, and say, okay, how that sister says she's a Christian, filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues. And early in the morning, here is a man coming out of her house. And that I'm going to say, because it looks like evil, chances are you never do nothing. But guess what? You were, you, you were criticized because you have something that looks like evil. It wasn't evil. You never do a thing. But it looks like evil. Can I preach a while here, somebody? Am I making sense here? Now, hear the worst part about it. The devil tells you that you have the command over your body. So, this is your friend. You don't have to make him sleep on the ground. You might go sleep in the coach and you call him and say, No, man, you don't have to sleep in the coach. And he say, But me here, say, You're a Christian man, so I'm not too to walk in the bed with you because you know all fire stick is if you catch and you say, Come on, man, come in the bed, no problem. If me don't want to do nothing, you can't make me do nothing. Yeah. You think I look at church sister when you ask them, say, Sister, you have a relationship. They move it vex. Vex with you and push up them out and say, Jesus, I'm a boyfriend. The only boyfriend me have is Jesus. So that belly where you get me one way for Jesus breed you. That belly where I see you with is Jesus get you pregnant. That's where the Bible says, stay away from the very appearance. If it looks like evil, shun it. Take him in the bed with you. Eh, not true. Because you're a strong Christian, not true. And he's flashing and right over you. Can you sleep bad? Mm, so you're a strong Christian, but look at you. If it looks like evil, stay away from it. You know, the Africans have a style. When you say you're a Christian, you can't come in fornication. If we say to you, say, no man, I'm not doing anything. Let me just, let me just, let me just rest it right here, sir. Let me just, let me just rest it. 
Look, let me just rest it on the moat, man. I'm not putting it. Mm. Paul has his reason why he says to the church at Thessalonica, stay away from it. From the moment you and this woman are in a nothing, you should not be seen with her anywhere. Am I making sense? All right, I'm going to show you something. As I was saying the other day, the Bible says a little leaving leaving the whole lump. Be extra careful. Take no chance. Mm -hmm. Once you get near to evil, evil gets closer to you. So, the devil says, it's not like I'm going to give you a French kiss. All I want, man, is a little troops, a good night troops. You know the like good night kiss? Yeah, we went out for dinner. So just, just a little troops on the cheek. Yeah. Well, that little troops on the cheek soon turn into another troops or into a bigger troops. Are we together today? Are we together today? Are we together today? All right, look at this now. The Bible says, stay away from the very appearance of evil. Lot erected his tent, the Bible says, near the gate of Sodom. That's what he did. He erected his tent where? Never went into Sodom, you know. He erected the tent near to Sodom. Guess what? By the time the angel of God went to Sodom to take out Lot and his family, where was Lot sitting? In the very gates of Sodom. He was not near anymore. Oh, you're not following me. When he pitched his tent, he pitched his tent near Sodom. But guess what? Sodom was full of all different kind of wicked people. And the last thing the Lord wants you to do is to get mixed up with them. But Lot went near. Not, not going into near. Just went near. After a while, he was in Sodom. So Paul has his reason. When he said, stay away from all appearances of evil. Once it looks like it's evil, chances are it's evil. So stay away from it. Stay clear of it. You see, it is bit by bit that the devil ropes in people. Come on, somebody. Are we still here? Yes. And you know that one sin leads to another? Yes, man. Uh -huh. Once a husband starts to lie, once he starts to have an have, have extramarital relationship, he guess what? No, he starts to lie to you know. And a side go. Yes, man, he starts to lie. Because when the wife sees the lipstick and his clothes and when she questions him about it he will have to find something to say it's not said go yes man so one sin leads to another and bit by bit satan is mixing you up and wrapping you up and putting you down after a while nobody lie like you after a while you become a pathetic liar after a while you lie for nothing You know we have some men in life and nothing. Maybe because they are accustomed to, to, to lying so much. The life and nothing. You see them coming from over there and him feel a little embarrassed to say, all right, uh, him feel a little embarrassed because you should not see him walking. You went tell you, say, um, I just coming from over there because guess what? Uh, one man over there want to buy me a car. 
So, is it I go talk to him about? He don't have no car, he never won one. But he have, they have become so accustomed to lying that if they don't lie, they don't feel good. That's why the Bible says, stay away from the very appearance of you because sometimes when you think that this is just a white lie or a joke, it just teaches you how to lie and lie and lie and lie. And everything, you lie your way out of everything. A lot of people who are backslidden today, the reason they are backslidden is because what they were getting involved into, they didn't see it as anything. As far as they are concerned, as far as they are concerned, or they were concerned at the time, if you have a boyfriend, you have to kiss that boyfriend. No, if you really love that boyfriend, you know, and you kiss that boyfriend, don't tell me, say, that kiss not going to mean nothing to you. You hear what the last verse down there is saying, or toward the last verse, you hear what it says, and not going to read it, but if you, if you read it, you will see. It says, greet one another with a holy kiss. That means that there is such a kiss as, as not holy. Are you hearing me, somebody? As a matter of fact, kiss may be a mouth to mouth something. Some persons are greeting with worse than that. Hmm? Are we still here? Quenching the spirit. And sometimes people think that. I have a hundred reasons why the service is so heavy. The service is not heavy because of what happened Sunday morning inside the church. The service may be heavy because of the different persons who are supposed to be belonging to that body of Christ. Not living anything. And the spirit is quenched. As I said before, the Greek word means to extinguish. It's like, like a fire blazing and you throw cold water on the fire. Mm. saw one of our brothers the other day he said the reason he never came to church is that is that his car overheated and someone came helping him and they take some cold water and pour it in the radiator now by the time he drive off a wreck off come for that what do you think happened you quench the black man. You quench the engine. Once you quench the engine, you, you walk the head. Because you can't have fire blazing in an engine. And the engine well hot and all the black and pissed and hot. And you take cold water and I want to pour in that. That quencher becomes like an insult to the car. Are we still here, church? Same thing. When we are serving God in the church, we will have to make sure that the spirit is able to operate in free course and in the band of the spirit. Not just to prevent the working of the spirit on me, but to prevent the things that we know would quench the spirit. Sometimes, this is the last thing I'm saying, but sometimes in the very way we operate church, quench the spirit. Some kind of worship that I see I don't endorse it at all. Hmm? God is using the preacher. And, and uh, 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 the preacher is the one having the microphone now. Hear what the Bible says. Let everything be done decently and in order. Preacher having the microphone and somebody down there in the congregation. I heard the voice of Jesus say might be a voice is in my hearing or not voice because the voice of jesus talking to that preacher right now you're not supposed to be talking to him or her are you with me somebody no that is a quencher that is a quencher that is a quencher right and sometimes we feel like we like we are pleasing the spirit but it can be a quencher too
All of a sudden, Spirit say you must jump up and go over there so I can rebuke that brother there. Yeah. No, that is a quencher. Because number one, the brother go back say what you are doing in front of him. Hmm? You're in front of him, I cut and clear and do all kind of something. That is a quencher. Go and sit down. My brother loved church one night so much that he couldn't stop to brush his teeth. So he ran on the road with his, two, with, with his toothpaste and toothbrush. So while he coming to church, or while he was going to church, he brushing teeth. And when he was finished, he just put it, the, the, the toothbrush in his jacket pocket. And one church sister must glimpse it. And the glimpse, she glimpsed it, she started speaking tongues. A pipe, a pipe, a pipe, a pipe, a pipe, a pipe. Interpreter said, Holy Ghost, say a pipe. In her pipe in there. Look in the jacket pocket, if in her pipe. Say, Come, brother, brother, turn on the jacket pocket. He turned on the jacket pocket. I am toothbrush. No, that is a quencher. That is a quencher. Go and sit down. Right? You cannot have service going on. And you're doing contrary things and think that you're pleasing God. Those kind of outbursts quench the spirit. They were having a convention. A church was having a convention in St. Elizabeth the other day. And a brother got up. And he said, brethren, I'm not well. I'm not all right. And the church listening off. He said, I'm not all right, brethren. Because bishop will not leave my wife. No, a bishop supposed to preach the night, you know. Hmm. Well, they listened to him. And convention was over for the day. The night when bishop came to preach, I, I, I don't know if anyone told him, but the night when he went up to preach, he couldn't preach anything because all of the words... Every word he said just bounced right back on him. No one received it. Now what do you call that? It's a quencher. Sometimes you must know when to talk than when to hold your peace. Because if you talk out of terms, it is going to be a quencher. Oh, do you hear me, somebody? Do you hear me, somebody? And when the spirit is quenched, Believers, nothing is going to happen because it is the spirit that runs the church. It's not bishop that runs the church. Bishop only plays a part. It is not mother that runs the church. Mother only plays a part. It is the spirit of God that runs the church. So when the spirit of God becomes quenched, service dead, service over. So quench not the spirit. Allow the spirit his free course. And just remind the church that the spirit is not an it. The Jehovah's Witnesses, their doctrine says the spirit, the, 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 the Holy Ghost is God's active force. If, God, that, if the Holy Spirit is God's active force or Jehovah's active force, as they say, it means then that the spirit is just a thing. No, 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 no. The spirit that I am talking about is not the breeze outside. I am talking about the third person of the Godhead body in the Trinity, who is a person. Peter said unto Ananias, why you let the devil tempt you, fill your heart with lies to lie to the Holy Ghost. You have not lied unto man, but unto God, which means you lie unto a person. And not just the person, but the greatest person. So the Holy Ghost is a person. Don't quench him. Our lifestyle can quench him. Hallelujah. But if we obey these imperatives and if we get them together and get it right, then the Holy Ghost will run the church as whole the church should be run. Praise the Lord. And when you see what happened back in the days, you wonder if God is not alive today. Of course he's alive. But he's waiting for the church to give the Holy Ghost a chance. Amen. Amen, church. Holy Ghost needs a chance. Not only to prevent the working of the Spirit upon you, 
but he needs a chance to break free the church and to have his way because the only time we're going to be delivered is when he's able to have his way in our lives. So God bless you today. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. Quench not the spirit. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you. What a mighty God you are. Indeed you are. And as we work with the Holy Ghost, because the scripture tells us that we are workers together with God. The scripture tells us that we are indeed workers together with him. And as lively stones, we build up a spiritual temple. We pray that you will forgive us of all our attempts in, in the past to quench the Holy Spirit. And now that we have been brought to this juncture where we look into your word and see that the Holy Spirit does not appreciate being quenched or being put out or extinguished, we ask you, Lord, as we take it from here, going forward, you will help us to work in tandem with the Holy Spirit. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. And amen. Lord God. Hallelujah.
Lord. Thank you, Jesus.